We came up at a time where we learned this whole thing together. We went through all this together. Now, that's the first time I, I, I saw him. That's not and the first time I met him. Ever since then, we've been doing this. At <laughs> clubs all over the country. Eddie don't want to fight me. I got hands. <laughs> I, I, this furniture started moving, Jimmy. He don't want to fight me. <laughs> it appears that Arsenio Hall, a longtime admirer of Eddie Murphy, is once again standing up for his friend. Amid recent alleged claims made by Eddie Murphy regarding Hollywood's undisclosed secrets, there have been reports suggesting that he is facing blacklisting from the industry. Reportedly, Arsenio Hall has stepped forward, issuing a warning to those potentially involved in such actions. I don't know what's going to happen now because I suggested to him, I said, you know, they have a drive in here and you can do stand up and people blow their horns when it's funny. Eddie Murphy and Arsenio Hall share a bond that transcends their incredible on-screen collaborations. They are best friends in real life. Their friendship spans nearly four decades, originating from their days as aspiring comedians in Los Angeles. Introduced by the legendary Keenan Ivory Wyans, their connection has remained unbreakable, offering unwavering support through life's triumphs and tribulations. Keenan Wayans called me and said, why don't you meet us at the improv? Because Keenan's a New York comic and they were friends with Eddie. And he said, Damon, my brother's coming. You haven't met Damon, you gotta. The comedic synergy between Murphy and Hall has birthed some of cinema's most legendary moments. Thus, when the time came for Eddie Murphy's induction into the NAACP Hall of Fame, Arsenio Hall gladly took on the responsibility of honoring his friend. Both Murphy and Hall are esteemed figures, not only within black culture, but also in the annals of comedy history. Keenan heard that story and introduced us. And the first thing Eddie ever said to me in, in Murphy fashion, he looked at me and he says, you don't look like me. Beyond their on-screen chemistry, Eddie Murphy and Arsenio Hall share a genuine and enduring friendship. Their bond extends far beyond the spotlight, as evidenced by Arsenio's role as the godfather to Eddie Murphy's eldest daughter, Bria. This significant gesture underscores the depth of their connection. For Bria, having Arsenio Hall as her godfather is undoubtedly an extraordinary and thrilling experience, adding an extra layer of coolness to her life. In 1988, Eddie Murphy stood as one of the foremost stars globally, boasting a string of blockbuster hits to his name. Arsenio Hall, meanwhile, was ascending as a guest host on The Joan Rivers Show and helming The Late Show on the burgeoning Fox network. Their collaboration on the iconic film, Coming to America, marked the birth of a comedic gem. Not only did they portray the central characters, Prince Akeem, Murphy, and his faithful companion, Semi, Hall, but they also brought to life a multitude of other memorable personas, including Randy Watson and Reverend Brown. Fast forward over 30 years later, and they reunited United to revive their roles and the uproarious alter egos in the sequel. You know, but that's a great way to promote the movie. I even had a title, uh, Coming All Over America. And I thought that would be <laughs> yeah. a perfect title. And he loved yeah. that. Coming to America. Indeed, beyond their iconic roles in the Coming to America franchise, Eddie Murphy and Arsenio Hall shared another comedic triumph in the classic film, Harlem Nights. One particularly memorable scene involves Quick, Murphy, being pursued as a suspect in the M of Tommy Smalls, the muscle man of a rival gangster. Hall's portrayal of Smalls' grieving brother not only showcased his comedic talent but also delivered one of the film's most hilarious moments. Hall's performance, particularly his epic crying and comical handling of his partner's diminutive firearm, was certainly deserving of recognition, perhaps even an image award of his own. That's basically what the movie's about. And I <laughs> He's not for real. <laughs> You have to see the movie. He's not really dead at the movie. During Johnny Carson's reign on The Tonight Show, Black America was captivated by the epitome of cool late-night television, The Arsenio Hall Show. From January 3rd, 1989 to May 27, 1994, it was an appointment viewing. Hall curated a lineup of beloved musicians and actors, gracing both his interview couch and performance stage. With Eddie Murphy as a close ally, you knew the show would never lack star power. Murphy frequented the program, whether to promote his latest project or simply share laughs with his friend. As Auntie Dionne Warwick would say, that's what friends are for. In the late 1980s, amidst Eddie Murphy's leather-clad swagger and Arsenio Hall's iconic flat top, they united to form the Black Pack. This crew comprised the hottest black content creators of the era. We have a group that I like to call the Black Pack, Murphy declared. We basically hang out together and bounce ideas off each other. Among its members were Murphy, Hall, Paul 
Paul Mooney, Robert Townsend, and Keenan Ivory Wayans. All were multi-talented figures in comedy, acting, writing, producing, and directing, rising to prominence in Hollywood around the same time. Each has since become an icon in their own right. Plus, let's be real, the name Black Pack exudes unparalleled style, and this time Hall is proving that Eddie cannot be blackballed from the industry at any cost. Protecting the dignity and legacy of black comedians is a collective endeavor that transcends racial divides. Trailblazers such as Arsenio Hall have shouldered this responsibility, working tirelessly to uphold the esteem of black comedic talent. Yet, there are emerging reports indicating Hall's disillusionment with these efforts. He appears to feel disheartened by what he perceives as setbacks, particularly citing figures like Tyler Perry, whom he believes may compromise the strides made within the community. I'm black! I'm black, man! I'm the biggest minority you know about! I don't wanna hear that gay trash, man! I got gay friends I've had on the show because you don't know them or it ain't who you want on the show, you got a problem with it? In the early 90s, a time when many black comedians drew inspiration from the legendary Richard Pryor, Arsenio Hall distinguished himself by blending his unique comedic style with broad appeal. His infectious smile, vibrant personality, and insightful take on life resonated with audiences of diverse backgrounds, making his humor universally relatable. From 1989 to 1994, during the initial five-year run of his nationally syndicated show, Hall offered a platform for the black community that was notably absent in late-night television. Through his show, he amplified voices and perspectives that were frequently overlooked elsewhere, cementing his place as a trailblazer in entertainment. This is, this is cable, so I can say it like I really felt. That's a plain war. <laughs> That's what I really felt, you know? Magic, you see him do during the era dominated by Jay Leno, Johnny Carson, and Conan O'Brien, the Arsenio Hall Show played a pivotal role in elevating artists of color to a wider audience. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, hip-hop culture struggled for representation, often limited to a brief segment on shows like Yo! MTV Raps. Despite the emergence of influential figures like N.W.A. and Tupac, their visibility was hindered by mainstream media's tendency to sensationalize and misrepresent them as controversial figures. However, Arsenio Hall's show broke barriers by providing a platform for black artists such as Eddie Murphy, Michael Jackson, Will Smith, and Snoop Dogg to showcase their talent and express themselves authentically on national television without fear of censorship or apology. What do you hate most about show business? I don't hate anything about show business. I don't hate it. I love what I do and I love... However, despite all his hard work, reportedly black celebrities are being tried to blackballed. And when it comes to his best friend, he is not going to sit quietly. Eddie Murphy recently unveiled a revelation shedding light on Hollywood's historical treatment of black actors. He disclosed that the industry had deliberately fostered division among black actors, prioritizing discord over unity. Murphy highlighted covert tactics employed to enforce the segregation, alluding to undisclosed actions perpetuating this harmful divide. His comments underscore a disturbing reality where black actors, instead of standing united, are set against each other. Murphy suggests that these detrimental dynamics have been ingrained in the psyche of emerging black actors, exacerbating division within their community. Envision Eddie Murphy taking on a role in a project helmed by Jordan Peele, or witnessing Jamie Foxx and Denzel Washington establishing their own production company. Interestingly, there's a notable absence of collaboration between Eddie Murphy and Spike Lee throughout their careers. These two individuals, each holding esteemed positions in Hollywood, exemplify a common trend among influential black creatives today. They avoid collaborating due to the fear that working together might lead Hollywood to dismantle the successes they've individually cultivated. To make it, you gotta You gotta be relentless. You gotta persevere. You gotta be focused. Numerous theories reveal that Eddie Murphy has been part of over 50 movies in under five years, and only a fraction of those involve a black director. This apprehension, which underscores the industry dynamics, might explain the absence of a collaboration between Spike Lee and Tyler Perry on a project. A similar sentiment could be behind the fact that Will Smith and Denzel Washington have not joined forces for a series of films, mirroring the dynamic seen with Al Pacino and Robert De Niro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was, it was, it was wise. Especially that we are meeting kind of for the first time, that's important. So yeah, that does help. Yeah.
The underlying reason for Spike Lee and Eddie Murphy's lack of collaboration seems to run deeper. In the current moment, a global awareness has emerged regarding the vulnerability of black lives, attributed to systemic issues that have generated troubling outcomes. With the amplification of the Black Lives Matter movement, an increasing number of individuals are recognizing the need for transformative change, starting with the empowerment of economic influence. The president of the Canadian Black Chamber of Commerce says more businesses are seeking her help. This shift in awareness has prompted a widespread desire to back Black-owned businesses, thereby fostering the circulation of wealth within the Black community. The significance of supporting such enterprises, though newly emphasized, is not an entirely novel concept. In Power Dynamics, a book authored by Dr. Claude Anderson, the value of analyzing spending patterns among Black Americans is discussed. Ultimately, the narrative underscores the critical significance significance of maintaining black funds within black control. Black folk don't uh, fail to understand that the original, that schools are not change agents. They are mm -hmm. only doing what the environment wants it to do. Schools in this country starting in the 1860s were designed. This leads us to Spike Lee's emergence in the early 1980s as he embarked on crafting his own identity in the industry. During this time, he openly criticized not only Eddie Murphy but also other black individuals within Hollywood for failing to establish pathways for others akin to themselves. In a 1989 interview with Rolling Stone, Murphy offered his response to these allegations. Spike Lee had expressed his belief that Murphy might have overlooked using his clout to advance the presence of black individuals in influential roles, particularly within Paramount. Don't you think I realize what's going on here, miss? Who do you think I am, huh? Don't you think I know that if I was some hot shot from out of town that pulled inside here? He further said, they were to me on Saturday Night Live a couple of times after I'd left the show. They said some things. I made a stink about it. It became part of the folklore. What really irritated me about it at the time was that it was a career shot. I felt about it for years, but now, I don't have none of that. Eddie Murphy and Spike Lee seem to adopt distinct approaches in addressing racism within Hollywood. Interestingly, during the production of Do the Right Thing, there were instances of Murphy visiting Lee on set. However, in a 1989 appearance on the Arsenio Hall show, Murphy Murphy playfully extended their friendly rivalry by humorously referring to Lee as a cricket, adding another layer to their dynamic. I love Spike Lee. Mm -hmm. I seen Spike come on the show last week and women said, Wah! And Spike looks like a cricket. A year later, the two men engaged in a direct conversation regarding their respective stances. Their viewpoints seemed to align with the different approaches of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. In a one-on-one -on -one interview featured in Spin Magazine, Lee and Murphy delved into their ongoing feud. Lee expressed the notion that Eddie Murphy had the potential to exert greater influence toward change. He's a brilliant filmmaker, his movies are brilliant, he's, he's hysterical, he's, he's wonderful on camera, but Spike is not fine. He'll... During the middle of the interview, Murphy openly shared his candid perspective on why he believed there was a lack of collaboration among black individuals in Hollywood. Because I think black people aren't the most unified people on the face of the the earth we got to get everybody scheduled together everybody says it's cool but that doesn't ever come in a contemplative manner murphy pointed out the existence of various groups within the community he remarked on the apparent division prevalent among people of the same race highlighting that historically this division was imposed rather than inherent referencing the era of slavery he alluded to instances where united groups of slaves were purposely disbanded fast forwarding to the present murphy noted that when a black individual achieves success there's often a tendency to isolate oneself and claim ownership of accomplishments. He attributed this hesitancy to unite to an underlying fear of jeopardizing personal equilibrium in the pursuit of collective collaboration. We got all shit is hooked up with black people. Chinese people all around because they got little and little asses. Murphy emphasized that this inherent division isn't a conscious choice, but rather ingrained. He underscored that this fearfulness was a product of the apprehension white individuals have towards black individuals. Recounting a personal encounter, he shared an incident involving Mike Tyson. During a gathering at Eddie Murphy Productions, Murphy found himself in the company of Mike Tyson and Don King. Reflecting on his workplace, where his managers were the only white employees, the trio delved into a discussion about white people and government matters. Strikingly, the conversation took a whispered tone a phenomenon Murphy attributed to the deep-seated apprehension that the influence of the white man had instilled, leading even to discreet discussions within one's own abode. They do it.
up the way they walk, they be walking all light because they ain't got no shit pulling them down. The long-awaited classic interview emerged as an opportunity for both individuals to address the misunderstandings between them. However, more than a decade passed before any indications of their potential collaboration came to light. It was during this time that Spike Lee secured a role in a James Brown biopic and contemplated enlisting Eddie Murphy for the project. Regrettably, Lee's involvement was short-lived as he was eventually replaced by director Tate Taylor. So his balance, he'd be doing all this. Skipping ahead to 2014, Chadwick Boseman took on the lead role in the movie instead of Eddie Murphy. Despite the ongoing absence of a film collaboration between Murphy and Lee, discussions have persistently surfaced. In 2011, it was reported that Murphy was lined up to portray former DC Mayor Marion Barry in a biopic directed by Spike Lee for HBO. However, Spike Lee changed his intentions and did not go with Murphy. Notably, Murphy's earlier observations about the unconventional dynamics for black individuals in Hollywood prompted efforts towards the establishment of a genuine black Hollywood scene. Every time you see a brother in a wheelchair, he ain't always crippled. You got this sh hanging down. Here. Back in 1988, an article by Paul Mooney in the Los Angeles Times unveiled Murphy's, Robert Townsend's, Keenan Ivory Wayans's, and Arsenio Hall's endeavor to unite under the banner of the Black Pack. The specifics behind the dissolution of this initiative remain unclear, but Murphy's conversation with Spike in Spin Magazine offers a glimpse into why the collaboration may not have endured. With the backdrop of societal protests unfolding on the streets, the current juncture invites contemplation on transitioning the protest to the realm of filmmaking. It raises questions about addressing racism, whether through a subdued or vociferous cinematic approach. Even if they did have some skills, they were still enslaved. However, Eddie's fans have supported him with every possible power. One of them wrote, They always want to try and make us feel less than, but we shall keep overcoming all hardships brought upon us. We must not get upset and angry and continue to overcome certain groups of people constantly punching down on us. These people are in need of feeling more than what they really are. Another one added, Sad everyone going after black authors that have shared the horror and hope of people that were sold by Africans to a foreign land and then generations excelled in face of evil. Hope is not encouraged in this decade. Furthermore, over the years, many black comedians have chosen to wear dresses in pursuit of laughter. The juxtaposition of a towering presence in heels creates an inherently ludicrous and consequently humorous visual, yet the implications run deeper. This trend has seen numerous black male comedians embracing cross-dressing for comedic effect. What is the price of this comedy rooted in cross-dressing? As Dave Chappelle said, With certain dots, like when I see that they put every black man in the movies in a dress, at some point in their career, I'd be connecting them down like, wow, these brothers got to wear a dress. During a recent appearance on Oprah's show, comedian Dave Chappelle raised a thought-provoking query. He pondered the prevalence of accomplished black male entertainers resorting to cross-dressing during some phase of their careers. Notably, Martin Lawrence achieved recognition for his lead role in the Big Mama's House series. Similarly, Eddie Murphy included a female character among the array of roles he undertook in his Nutty Professor film series. This happened to me. I'm doing a movie with Martin. Yeah. The movie's going good. So I walk in a trailer. I'm like, man, this must be the wrong trailer because there's a dress in here. Jamie Foxx left his mark with the unforgettable, ugly Wanda persona on In Living Color, whereas Marlon and Sean Wyans embraced gender reversal for their roles in White Chicks. Additionally, the ill-fated Juana Man movie from a few years back remains a chapter we may wish to put behind us. I'm here! Ooh, that girl get around. Really? Me, right? Amongst these instances, one figure stands out as the most prominent cross-dresser of our time, Tyler Perry. Known not only for his entertainment ventures but also for his right-wing evangelical influence, Perry's Medea franchise has achieved considerable success and recognition. Are you going out on Black Friday? What the hell is Black Friday? Every Friday, out is Friday, I'm black, that's a Black Friday. What are you talking about? <laughs> While Tyler Perry has carved a prosperous path within the gospel play realm, he's effectively extended his triumph to the film industry, bringing his contemporary portrayal to a larger cinematic canvas. No, oh, it's, it? a, it's, a, it's a stage play. It's, oh, it's like Broadway, just with black people. Remarkably, his latest book, Don't Make a Black Woman Take Off Her Earrings, even secured a spot on the prestigious New York Times bestsellers list. 
This prompts an inquiry. What underlies this phenomenon? Why do these artists engage in acts that seemingly emasculate themselves? And why does the audience eagerly embrace the spectacle of the black man being subjected to such humiliation? The portrayal of black masculinity in a more feminine context could potentially lead to a perception of reduced threat and increased ease for certain individuals. Such cross-dressing depictions of black men might function as a way to counterbalance the dominant and forceful image commonly associated with hip-hop culture. Because this f***ing industry is a monster! Over the span of several years, it's been reported that Hollywood played a significant role in perpetuating various stereotypes, unfortunately contributing to the shaping of public perception about black individuals for a significant part of the audience. During this time, a debate emerged, suggesting that due to the limited opportunities within the entertainment industry, black artists often felt compelled to take on stereotypical roles as a way to sustain their livelihood. It, a weak person cannot get to sit here and talk to you. Although the entertainment industry hasn't fully reached a state of racial equality, present-day performers do have a certain level of control over their choices. What remains puzzling in the context of these current figures is their seeming openness to adopt cross-dressing roles, with Kevin Hart's name particularly prominent in this regard. Uh, Pope Convention is lifting her arms into her signature muscle man pose. Mm. Many people have come out to express that they are opposed to witnessing further instances of black men in dresses, with the belief that this phenomenon has run its course. Supposedly, our society is already influenced by numerous factors seeking to undermine the masculinity of black men, and there's no need to contribute to these forces in any way. When things happen that can possibly affect your brand, your, your brand can be diminished, and, and you, don't, you don't want that to happen. So, you know, protecting my brand is, is definitely a priority. People have expressed that they are opposed to witnessing further instances of black men in dresses. This phenomenon has run its course. Our society is already influenced by numerous factors seeking to undermine the masculinity of black men. There's no need to contribute to these forces in any way. I was like, no, I'm gonna look stupid. <laughs> At the end of the day, you gotta know that you're a brand. Over an extended period, Hollywood took the forefront in propagating a range of stereotypes that regrettably ended up shaping the perception of black individuals for a significant portion of the population. Throughout this era, a contention arose that due to limited opportunities in the entertainment industry, black artists often found themselves compelled to accept stereotypical roles as a means of securing their livelihood. While opinions vary on this argument, it's important to acknowledge that this era has since come to an end. As Murphy said, I do the pilot, show up here and there. None of the movie scripts were right. It was trying to force the premise. If you have to force something, you shouldn't be doing it. Another notable black person that has spoken on this is Cornel West. He stands out as a distinctive type of civil rights champion. While many other notable leaders frequently step into the spotlight through high-profile press events, West's impact has been subtly significant during crucial racial moments across the United States, particularly within the entertainment sector. Defying the conventional approach, this eloquent intellectual doesn't rely on a formal organization or entourage, yet his charismatic appeal has drawn the focus of an emerging cohort of African-American activists. So that what was once in place, much more stronger moral conviction Conviction, we saw ruthless ambition. At present, Cornel West is vocal about the treatment of impoverished and marginalized Americans. Renowned for his incisiveness and fearless stance on matters of race, he particularly doesn't shy away from critiquing President Obama. He said, When I call the president a black puppet of Wall Street, I was really talking about the degree to which Wall Street had a disproportionate amount of influence on his policies, as opposed to poor people and working people. In the view of Cornel West, his dedicated endeavors embody a novel and courageous style of activism rooted in vision. The pivotal inquiry persists. Will his justified indignation manifest as animosity and retribution, or will it be channeled towards compassion and equity? Significantly, West is committed to guiding the public along the route of love and justice. He said, oh, very much so. I think that's a marvelous new militancy that has to do with courage, vision. The fundamental challenge always is, will their rage be channeled through hatred and revenge, or will it be channeled through love and justice? You got to push them toward love and justice. From Cornell West's viewpoint, the chief obstacle to fostering constructive race relations both within the entertainment industry and across the nation is what he labels nihilism, the prevailing sense of hopelessness and diminished worth experienced by numerous members of the black community. And it is not connected to the energies of black poor people. It's completely severed.
In his insightful publication titled Race Matters, authored in the initial months of 1993, West delves into his philosophical perspective. He encourages both individuals of black and white communities to fully comprehend the deep interconnection between racism and race throughout American history. Cornel West enjoys strong backing from his admirers, who wholeheartedly support his stance. He emphasizes that recognizing the significance of race matters is essential for attaining a comprehensive grasp of everything inherently labeled as American. You get your professionals who surface at the top, they tend to be smart, self-promoting, not taking any risks. This highlights how Hollywood has historically propagated negativity among black actors, creating divisions that have hindered their ability to collaborate and work together. Eddie has also talked about the alleged hidden Oscar contract. Eddie Murphy has only received one Oscar nomination, and it was for his role in Bill Condon's musical Dream Girls. Murphy himself has acknowledged in interviews that he may not have exerted as much effort in that film as he does in most of his comedic roles. One of the greatest, funniest people of all time was a uh... George Carlin, and he received this award, award posthumously. One performance that continues to be critically examined in hindsight is his work in The Nutty Professor, where he used makeup and prosthetics to portray the entire Klump family. A similar technique was applied in the Coming to America films, particularly in the iconic barbershop scene. Hey, I ain't seen clean bed. I'm just saying I stopped liking Cash Clay. Want to change the name to Muhammad Ali? What kind of shit is that? Wait a second. During a conversation with Coming to America director Craig Brewer on the Real Blend podcast, we brought up Murphy's repeated snubs by the Academy, and Brewer shared his insights on why this pattern persists. He said, It really bothers me, and I feel that it's even more stilted against Eddie because the problem that I think people have with Eddie is that they think that it's easy for him. I'm sure there are many things in Eddie's life that feel easy, but what people don't know is what I see, which is him sitting in his chair, in makeup, he's putting on music, he's getting into a place, he's rehearsing these lines, you see him where he doesn't fool around on set. When you're in between takes, he goes to his chair and you see him get into this trance where he is working and working and working. There's craft there, and I worry that people think that like, oh, well, Eddie's just showing up and being funny like he's always done. And that's just not true. Yes, he's showing up and being hilarious, but it's not like he's just flipping a switch. Fans believe that it's indeed an unjust evaluation of comedians, and Eddie Murphy is not the sole funny individual to be overlooked due to the Academy's reluctance to fully recognize comedic talent. One person wrote on the internet, no one ever said Hollywood had morals. The award bit is true. The 1995 movie Heat had one of the most realistic gunfights ever filmed, and it didn't even get a nomination for the Oscars. Another one added, for award shows, it's also about campaigning and which studio will spend the most money to wow the jury, like Weinstein famously did. And you didn't talk about the pedophilia problem concerning chit actors. These sources suggest that the hidden powers of the industry are trying to blackball Murphy. However, it seems like Asenio will never make this happen to his friend. That's it for today. See you in the next video. Until then, goodbye.